Thank you, GSM, and much appreciation to Clean Tech San Diego for allowing the second edition of the Great Transformation to take place. A little bit of background, real quick, on me. Been in the industry for about uh, close to 20 years. Started with the Energy Trust of Oregon, focusing on program design, uh, saving our own commercial finance, transitioning to the Sultan Suite. Uh, but today, I think to a little bit more important is talk about the agency. So two and a half years ago, I launched Crest Creative to help support companies, uh, early stage and early stage companies to tell the story behind their technology. And today, uh, with Mark Jacobs, my uh, partner and managing director, we are now HealthFit. So we're excited to work with you, but business actually launched tonight. So thank you, Mark. So that um, this um, discussion is going to be focused on the technology to get us there. We have existing technologies and we have new technologies and have a, a great channel listening. Uh, Nina Jenkins, who is the CEO of ChargeNet Stations, my uh, friends and partner and just testing challenges, uh, David. Sami Penalbog, co-founder of Filiabletum, and Dan Roberts, head of sales of the website. So why don't um, all three of you tell me a little bit about their companies and Venus will start with food. Repeat. This one? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, Venus Jenkins, CEO and co-founder of Charge Destinations. Um, we are a charging developer and operator in a very specific market segment, and that is QSR, Quick Serve Restaurants, or also as you know, uh, won't know, know them as fast food restaurants. Why we selected this specific market segment? As us Americans, we love fast food. Uh, 100 million Americans eat fast food at fast food um, every day, and just California alone has 37,000 restaurants. So these are quite strategic locations, uh, close proximity to on-ramps, off-ramps, and, and built-in customers. And that's the market segment we have selected. Uh, along with our fast chargers, we also deploy battery storage. The last panel was uh, wonderful to hear the role of battery storage and we're future proofing it, uh, knowing that we will get a couple of cycles, just like Mark said. Um, so, but primary focus is on EV charging, uh, development, and operations. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Penava. I'm the co-founder of Dio Volta. Uh, we're the creators of this sort of great, which is a field work lab and um, very fast last platform for the, the for our EV industry. Uh, solar grid uh, helps uh, field technicians and solar professionals to streamline their day-to-day -day work on uh, digitize their offsite trains, uh, creating a new layer of data that complements performance uh, performance data. Um, the way I like to explain to people is that we're trying to create the car fax on solar, so the solar fax. Um, you would buy a car just based on uh, the mileage of the car. You want to wanna look at the car, you want to see if the car has been maintained properly, if any recalls. Uh, similarly, uh, the solar industry buys and sells uh, solar assets purely on the base star performance data uh, without really understanding the underlying issues that a lot of those assets might have, uh, which lead to, you know, data that like gets collected by field technicians that are there every day and to see the, you know, the real, the real products to these products. Um, yeah, as you know, we, we founded the company uh, almost three years ago. Uh, we launched our software uh, platform, uh, Solar Grade, uh, one and a half years ago after winning a solar software contest, a uh, contest organized by the Department of Energy called the American uh, Bay Talent on uh, yeah, we're part of the Southern California and Innovation Network. Uh, super excited to be here on yeah, some of our, uh, some of the largest uh, O&M EPCs on asset owners and technical advisors in the industry use our support today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Dean. Uh, Dan Roberts, head of sales for Bacta. 
And Lecta is a software platform uh, purpose built to help large commercial and industrial businesses play in here behind the meter systems, on site systems to make bits as a preferred term. Uh, we're typically working with uh, companies that have dozens, hundreds, in some cases, thousands of facilities scattered around the country or the world. And the biggest barrier for them adopting um, behind the systems has really been around uh, uh, getting the organizational uh, buying decision uh, to scout. And so we really focus on helping them determine where do they focus their time and efforts across this vast portfolio of facilities at the highest value facilities when accounting for energy prices, incentives, uh, great carbon intensity, variety of other factors. What, uh, what is the optimal system to build at the highest value sites? And then when they identify strong business cases and they get buy-in across the organization, uh, helping them determine which partners uh, they should partner with to finance, build, provide the equipment for these systems. So we're stripping out a uh, vast amount of the, the soft costs associated with deploying these systems um, and accelerating on the time range. That's great. Thank you, Dan. Um, by happenstance, you're serving my uh, preferred market segment, the most complex one from my vantage point. Uh, CNI's lagged residential and utility, right? But uh, what opportunity does Vecta City in the segment that's driving their innovation? Yeah, I think I appreciate the acknowledgement of the, the challenges in CNI. We see the same thing. Uh, got some stats that I share with people sometimes around across the US for it's about 4% penetration uh, in residential. Uh, last year, I believe over 50% of a new capacity that came online was renewable, yet uh, the bigger is uh, 1.5% in CNI. Um, so it's pretty, pretty dismal and a huge opportunity. We see uh, the biggest opportunity in, in driving to voltage forward is always in the kind of the economics. And as much as large corporations are the ones that are driving the net zero by X year, um, we rarely, uh, and, and I don't like to use absolute, so I use the term highly, see projects on the board that aren't going to break down their energy costs. So that means that we are largely helping companies identify where there are um, um, high energy fells, so it's pretty, pretty easy to, to identify, but where are the incentives, where are there opportunities to uh, optimize the current action with the grid so there's not a lot of instrument of the broader grid. I thought it was interesting that Mark brought up um, in, I believe it was summer and early September of 2022, the role that demand response play. I think that that's a huge opportunity for businesses to participate in that, but they can't participate in those programs if they have impacts uh, operations. So deploying on-site generation and storage allows them to participate in them. So I think the biggest piece for us is, is with as little information in or as little effort from these businesses, highlighting the opportunities and then delivering the metrics that sit across finance, here and operations, sustainability, in order for them to make these what we call one-way or, or one-way door decisions. Uh, and so that's the component is ensuring that these products can look through the capital filtrations cost us efficiently. E. So can I ask you a quick follow-up, easy question on top of that? So obviously the cost of energy was rising. We're trying to mitigate risk. But at the same time, we have this low inflation rate for many years. And now the cost of capital is rising. How are you finding that in your seat as head of sales and trying to convince people to make use decisions in this kind of environment? And the, the tailwinds of rising rates are probably stronger than that of the uh, interest rates. Uh, we also help as known across the variety of different commercial structures, uh, whether it be then, in some cases, very cash-rich organizations that are wanting to cash all the incentives themselves, uh, where the debt vehicles are really more towards PPAs for these on-site systems. Um, I think the biggest piece is when we look at a company that has, say, 150 facilities scattered around the country, there are going to be some great gems within there in order for them to 
get that organizational environment. We're also seeing companies increase their typical payback period for these projects. So whereas normal capital projects need to have a so three or sub so three year payback period, if there are emissions reduction opportunities, we're seeing and in some cases as high as a 10 year threshold to get some of those other ancillary inputs beyond just the, the cost savings. So I think the rates are going to continue to, to help. And you touched on it. I mean, it's uh, uh, the, the increase in rates create a good environment for those that are helping deploy uh, the years. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Venus, we were talking a little bit before this panel got started. EV mobility, obviously, in the state of California, and California is almost always at the lead of technology adoption in our vertical. Do you think that EV mobility and the work that you're doing should be a catalyst for change? Do you say driving change in project development? Absolutely. Um, along with the hardware uh, technological advancements, there is also financial engineering advancements. And then a little bit alluded to it too, the time period, pay gap time period going from three to 10 years. Um, I look at it as that we have basically cracked a nut where there is appetite in the market, which didn't exist before. It was strictly limited to utility scale projects. Now there is appetite to fund EV charging infrastructure projects because uh, there are there's there's this breakthrough on the financial engineering side too. Um, there is interest in looking at long term payback on these projects. Uh, so yes, uh, three years ago when we started this company, uh, we we learned quite a bit and we have gone through multiple iterations of. Uh, real estate transaction as well as financial engineering transactions. And finally, in the last nine months or so, uh, we feel like, including the inflation rate too, we feel like now we have uh, project mechanics and project finance in place uh, that makes the end user or off taker comfortable. Uh, so there's that piece that we usually don't talk about when we're talking about technological advancements their financial engineering and that advancements as well. And definitely plays a role. Um, <clears throat> when I was looking at your website, um, I really liked we turned the far to watts into process setters. That kind of sounds compelling. Can you talk a little bit <coughs> about the role of opportunity in moving projects forward and having you came up with that? Absolutely. So uh, our company started uh, right before COVID and timing matters. Uh, and not saying that COVID hit and that's what, how we came up with this. Um, but the, the idea behind that was when we looked at the QSR market, the fast food restaurant market, we saw early signs that their parking lots were highly underutilized. That's underutilized real estate. Um, and then COVID happened. That most of the revenue was primarily driven through their drive-throughs. As high as 75 to 80 percent of the revenue was coming through drive-throughs. So now they have these mandatory parking lots with 16 to 20 parking spots uh, that are not revenue generating at that point. So when we looked at these real estate locations and being so strategically located uh, for EV adoption as well, uh, that's how we came up with this catchy thing, uh, converting parking lots into profit centers. Um, so we lease six to eight spots uh, from the QSR, and in, in return, they get a site lease payment. That's great. I really like uh, the way you're using that to get the business going. David, and it's good to see you. Rob, Brian with me, since he was not coming. <laughs> so he's right here in my socks. <laughs> I'm glad that he's on your socks. Uh, David, we got to know each other through a joint initiative with um, Andrew, my colleague, director of consulting at Mayfield Renewables, working with Megra on the electrical testing standards guide. Can you talk a little bit about 
the human element of technology adoption? Because uh, your software plays a big role in that, right? Yes, um, sure. So the way I like to put it is that we are in the AI era, but you still have to call your plumber <laughs> if something breaks in your house. So I think you know we still are gonna have to. We still need people on field technicians, the professionals that are you know out there just fixing a lot of the issues, uh, dealing with downtime, dealing with problems with inverters. On not only that, but how do we tackle problem actually quadrupling the capacity of the you know, U.S. grid in renewables in the in the next ten years? Will that have to need disqualified? Personnel will not have to eat consistency training. So that's what we are kind of going after from you know the software perspective. How can you use technology to enable uh, the labor force to work more consistent, um, you know, more efficient, and in the end, kind of being able to resolve issues faster, which improves that then, you know, uptime by reducing that to the I appreciate that. Um, we were talking earlier this fall, and I was learning your story over dinner, right? You were talking about the journey with SolarGrade. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you started? I mean, I know there's a, a much longer story, but yeah. you must have a lot of conviction and passion and belief in the value of the tool and the problem that you're solving. Yeah, so everything started with uh, this idea. Uh, when I've, I've been working in the solar industry for over 15 years. I've been down in the trenches, I've uh, designed a lot of systems myself, been on site uh, many, many times. I did a ton of work all over the world you know, with solar projects. And, um, it came down when I started seeing a lot of problems. People call you when they have problems. Uh, I got I'm unfortunately engaged in uh, huge litigation due to a uh, bunch of federal events on solar systems. Um, that really kind of got me going on understanding what was the root cause of a lot of these issues. Um, especially what you devote your professional life to work in the solar industry, and you see a fire and that makes the press, and everyone's talking about how dangerous the solar might be, and you know you don't want to have solar on your roofs because it might catch a fire. Similar to what similarly what's happening with the EV industry right now. Uh, that really kind of you know can be going is like, okay, how solar is extremely safe technology uh, when built properly. Uh, it needs to be properly QA, you know, QA, QC is very important as part of the process. It needs to be properly installed. Uh, how do we leverage technology to make sure that the process is falling? And that's really what, uh, you know, um, made us kind of come up with this idea as like, how can we leverage our knowledge for everyone else to, to the, you know, to be able to use it in, into the day to day use. I'll pose this uh, question or conversation about all three of you. When I think of uh, the transition from central to, dis to distributed energy resources, I mean, it's the built environment, you deal with hardware a lot. But I think that this decade, software has been playing a growing role. How do you get um, field technicians? Uh, people that are not that comfortable with software tools to adopt them in a meaningful way that we need we need it to happen, right? Yeah, you, you need to make it uh, very, very easy to understand and um, intuit it. So we put a lot of work into that, um, make their life very easy. So a lot of like, you know, pre-written workflows that come to step, step-by-step -step, uh, type of um, work. I, I think if they, it's, if the, if the people that are working in the field with very rough, you know, rough uh, conditions don't, you know, don't feel that they, you know, this this kind of that barrier of entry because it's too complicated for them to use the, that that means that they are gathering, you know, the, you know, all these super important knowledge that they they have. So you have to be, make it very intuitive and easy to use. That's the key, and out of it as much as possible. You know, just just. Make it simple, basically. It's just hard. Okay, yes. I, I was just uh, listening to the first part of your statement, and I uh, 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 maybe an opinion that most may some may agree, some may disagree on that. That software is going to play a big role. That is given, 
but I think in the next 10 year, infrastructure is going to play, play a significant role. Um, some of our early learnings uh, starting this company was we started out as a SaaS company. We have a software layer that integrates uh, battery storage and chargers, and then also uh, point of sale integration for single transaction for the end user. So that is an incredibly cool concept, but deployed on what assets, what hardware that didn't exist. The chargers and battery storage coupled together did not exist. So we had to build that first site. So I just wanted to highlight um, that infrastructure that we are building software for, that still has to scale. It, that hasn't scaled yet. Um, and yes, software, as I said, for us, um, we take great pride in making it as user-friendly as possible, the end user-friendly. So we have a huge software component too. So those are just my two cents on it. I think, Dan, before I give it to you, I think that makes great sense. Um, I think what I'm more talking to is the connectivity and integration that you're speaking to. Um, and hardware without software is becoming increasingly problematic. But Dan, you're going to Yeah, I was going to build on these stuff. Where and we confess this to the companies that we work with is that all of the software in the world that you use a lot of like our planning or carrying, none of it means anything until it cheats. Uh, I agree that uh, there is going to need to be a software component so that these are not, uh, in the term dumb systems, these are not systems that are just um, purely producing and exporting when they're participating in and on square rigs. If you're just getting great services and we ultimately get to a point where businesses and, and like the residents, it's a, a, a big dirt, are uh, the prosumers. Uh, and then there's a, the whole new head on of then and how we uh, not just consume from the grid, but react participants in the grid and, and software to feed upon all that. I think uh, another challenge here is complexity, right? So we're, a lot of us here are drawn to complexity, but uh, the general public often is not. And the rate of adoption of technology, I think simplification matters. Can, Dan, can you talk a little bit about when you're presenting the value proposition, how do you, how do you simplify all that we're trying to do? I think the people that we interact with on a regular basis are so overburdened by all the things that are on their plate. Uh, whether it's operations team ensuring that they are producing product, we're, we work with a lot of manufacturers, for example. Uh, and the operations team is concerned about cost and resilience. They, they, they largely do not care about the emission side of the equation. And then you've got the sustainability folks that I think about all things related to sustainability with an uh, emissions or waste or all that things. And so from our perspective, it's how do we minimize the burden and deliver the insights, that insight action? I think there's a lot of misconceptions and data and, and intelligence and, and crunching of that data to produce insights is, is one of the biggest components I'll go use an example. I was on the phone um, the other day, you know, a video conference the other day with one of the largest logistics companies in the world. Over a thousand facilities across the US and other thousand facilities globally. And my comment was made that among the thousand facilities of the US, and this is a key member of the energy committee, thinking that only about half a dozen of those would pencil for on site solar. I know that they have over 30 facilities just here in California alone. And so that, I believe, is a misconception and a lot of other, and working off of old data, not new cost structures not considering battery energy storage or considering battery energy storage only as a backup, not as a, 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 a key way to interact with the grid. Uh, and so I think being able to deliver those insights with little to no input from them, but understanding that businesses in a deeper way and using software to, to deliver those insights uh, is, is the biggest challenge that, that we're looking to tackle and solve. Thank you, Jen. But with your software, I think connectivity of assets 
this important and your the solar grades created for field work management. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how that's important and everything that we're trying to do in the field. Yeah, so the, the way you have to think about it is that, uh, you know, nowadays it takes a fairly long time to fix a product that erases from the performance. Let's say you, you're, you're IPP, you, you see you no know, system underperforming, you better to choose down. And then the whole process of getting someone to site and getting them to work on the inverter and kind of fixing RMA a uh, bit, you know, maybe the part that failed. And that takes a long time. So that's, um, that's where we see a lot of synergies on kind of a stream client that, that workflow on helping, you know, filter vision overall to, you know, what needs to be done, how, and can you kind of get ready to, to, the, to the work that needs to be produced. Uh, this to be done in, in detail. Um, yeah, this. <clears throat> this uh, trans transformation is a significant undertaking, obviously, and there's much challenges to it, but I try to be a rational optimist. Yunus, um, what are you excited about in the next 12 to 18 months that, that you see from your seat? Things, um, there is so much happening in this space. Uh, energy is exploding everywhere. Um, there's so many programs, uh, incentives, uh, huge tailwinds in EV adoption. Uh, I, I mean, when we started this company, it was three to five percent EV um, EV adoption rate. Uh, last I checked, it was. 23%, I think we clocked the net 23 last year. So it's not an exponential curve, it's a hockey stick curve, and I hope it stays on the hockey stick curve. Uh, so that's one thing that I'm excited about. The second thing is uh, this large pipeline of uh, infrastructure development. We have eight partnerships. Um, between those eight partnerships, uh, 60 sites under contract, and behind 60, there's 800 more sites in contract. I don't think a hard company can build all of them in 18 months, but that's the exciting part. Once we have the infrastructure ready with the software layer on top of it, then then it becomes uh, uh, an asset. Uh, I, I, I am so excited that the words are not even coming out of my mouth. It's just, <laughs> it, it's, you know, what, uh, Mara said, the multi-dimensional, multi-variable uh, way of looking at energy assets. So building that software layer, now you have access to infrastructure of how to follow the energy pricing signal. Um, is it that we use the batteries for chargers? Or do we use export to the grid? Do we aggregate the assets? It, it just there's so much happening uh, that uh, so those those were those are few of the things I'm excited about. Dan, um, being in sales, you have to be optimistic, right? Eternal, he yeah. said. <laughs> You're up. I think the 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 biggest shift that's happening. I was just looking at it late. We have a a monitor I've seen. Uh, on a weekly basis, all of major outages scattered across the country, and this week with this coal staff has been quite a few, especially across Oregon, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin. And with everything we've talked about today, there's been a lot of discussion of great scale projects and transmission, and a lot of major corporates are buying into offsite DPAs to, to meet their sustainability initiatives, but uh, none of that matters if your local uh, distribution system goes down and your business no longer has the ability to operate. And so I think resilience is, is working its way in the discussion quite a bit. And uh, doing any of these activities, not considering on-site generation and storage, um, does not give you those operational benefits. And I think companies are waking up to that. And so figuring out ways, and I'm sure I'm helping with this, but figuring out ways to factor those those risks and those costs in to the business case 
in order to, again, get that organizational investment decision making. I'll, I'll ask a, a follow-up question, Cezubra. So um, that's part of the reason why I like made market solar, a CapEx and MopEx. Are you, do you think we're at the point where mitigating risk is becoming material on these decisions relative to payback period? It's beginning. It's early, but it's beginning. I'm counting on you to sell. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a combination of, of that clear, tangible outage risk, and, it, and unfortunately, nobody believes it's going to happen to them until it happens. And then it's a big, everything's on fire, we need to, we need to solve this then. Uh, good example, we just had, uh, we do some work in the wine industry. It's interesting, wineries, most critical time of year for them, this three to four week harvest period. The Venn diagram on when public safety power shutoffs, so most likely that happen, is also a concentric circle. <laughs> and, uh, if one major pilot line, you just call this up on a, on a Friday and said, I know we've been talking about doing this for a while. Um, we just had our existing solar completely go offline. How quickly can you have uh, that some work done so we can build the cure new system? And so that is, is starting in between. The additional piece is around the uh, regulatory side of things. So uh, building decarbonization initiatives, the risk of not compliance, uh, and then certainly the ongoing like, rest of uh, consumer and public sentiment and uh, the, the, the risk of being pursued as not actually doing thing, anything uh, that would be considered additionality. So uh, the, 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 the carving markets are, and creating this, uh, this environment where actually building assets uh, <coughs> really in, in, it'll gain a lot in the, uh, in the field of uh, public opinion. David, uh, what's driving the growth of solar grid? What are you optimistic about? I'm excited about where we at right now. I joined uh, this industry a long time ago. We're in solar systems where a euros per one. It's ridiculous. I remember like people still in like solar models were a thousand bucks per solar panel. Um, I think now I see like, oh, I thought we were growing and then I see the hockey stick is like a massive 12 and then now we're in San Diego, it's a massive 12 that is coming, <laughs> surface up. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, we're not doing it, we're doing it. Uh, we're transforming the grid and I'm excited about everything that needs to be proved. There's a lot of things that we need to work on as an industry. There's a lot of, you know, work that we need to do on the quality and you know, reliability side of things. So we need to build the subsistence property. They fulfill the price to what they were built for. Um, it's exciting times. Um, you know, I think there were some, uh, I was surprised with uh, Baker on kind of the rest side, kind of seeing what's going on. You know, it's unfortunate, but I think we'll figure things out in the kind of the big, you know, big picture set of things. Uh, this is great times. Thank you. Tell me how I just thought the great time, so any questions of the audience? You put your hand to hold time, I'm finally going to recognize you. Because I like telecom and narrow space, we have a single water physicist can only deal with the reliability and those single point fears. You mentioned the water fears twice, as you all business, so I'm very curious about your reliability, so we'll share with your own systems. Uh, oh, that's a... Uh, Dogger kind of conversation, but yeah, I'll answer it to you. Uh, I don't know what was kind of can you the do you realize what's your own strategy for reliability in the similar point of Uh We're training. Yeah. So this, this uh, I'm trying to down think what's the uh, good like this too many nuances to your question. Uh, so. Trying to tell you a general answer that I will fit. But, you know, again, the, these systems uh, really need to think about uh, in storage or uh, solar system really rely on uh, one single point of, you know, failure, which is the inverter in, in, or in transformers in a lot of cases. How do you deal with that? Uh, so I think there, there are three components to it, which is one would be the parts, uh, having a, a workhorse, you know. 
parts logistics and replacements to all of the specific components of fail. Uh, the other one uh, will be kind of how do you have a white factor cell to kind of replace those on how quick can you do it on uh, having the, you know, the tools process of not the citrus adds to it. I mean, in the end, we're, we're talking about how, how can we have a good strategy to reduce that time, uh, which is what happens for a lot of the systems. I don't know if I answered your question, probably those are the other things that more. Single point of failure, um, yes, this has actually come up in quite a, uh, quite a lot of our operations conversations too. Um, for us, we're looking at chargers and battery storage. Uh, for chargers, there's already redundancy built into it because we have multiple locations. Um, and the only single point of failure I identify is the transformer itself. Um, and that is, uh, this is the cop I'd answer the answer, but that's utilities responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we, we have looked at, um, from operations perspective, uh, what are our uh, single point of failures and redundancies built into the system. And looking back at it, a transformer would be the single point of failure for us. Any other questions? Dan Jensen? I was just going to say, single point of failure is, I guess, a, a driving factor in businesses deploying these systems. Uh, the service coming in isn't single point of failure, but that's not the only option they have. Andrew, do you have a question? Any other questions from the audience? Way to act there. If you were all talking about software, I was just curious if you look at your roadmap in the next two to three years, like what new services, capabilities, things do you see uh, developing? What this SaaS come and move on? Yes, SaaS does come and apply. For us, it's, it's uh, delivering more what we call tailored intelligence, so local level intelligence at specific sites. Uh, not just about uh, uh, generation of storage, but it's starting to move as well into energy efficiency. And we felt that uh, energy efficiency was a very well oiled machine that everybody had figured out, and we're learning that that's not necessarily the case. So, how do we deliver more tailored intelligence with fewer uh, sets of, of input data from customers to get them to act? I think it gets really interesting with uh, 3D and virtual. Uh, we're not that far away where the built and digital worlds are going to interact in a, in a commercial way of thing. Yeah, for us, uh, we're going, uh, we're going uh, on the digital twinning uh, road wheel back. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. I think all the industries were leveraging um, stuff from all the industries to try to uh, come up with similar solutions where you can go to, you know, uh, solar power plant, convert those to an inverter, being able to see uh, the whole history of maintenance blocks, photos, cools where nine or happen, uh, and so on. Uh, have all that information digitized so it's accessible to the, you know, to the managers in the office and really understanding the analytics out of these systems. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to be done uh, right now. So. I have a question for Jamie. So can we uh, look at uh, sorry. Do you have the uh, yeah. uh, let me just add to what's on our software code map. Um, two components will be called is math engine, which would be the next generation of math engine. Is as these assets are being developed and deployed, um, what is the best use of these assets in the energy market? There is the end user who plugs in the car and using the charger, but then um, battery storage, how that plays into it. And that's very much following the rate structure and all of the programs coming out of utilities and our regulatory framework. Um, so that's one part of the software and it's highly complex. And then the second one, which is a bit more fun side, is the point of sale integration and that is loyalty programs. So, for example, as a Taco Bell, if you're charging your car at a Taco Bell, um, you can have a coupon for a burrito that you could redeem inside. So that's the, the fun part of it. The gamification. Um, yes, gamification. So that's uh, also on our software. <laughs> Last question, you can breathe. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to, uh, to ask you, 
how does your software exactly uh, improve the O&M experience, right? So we own and operate commercial solar assets like our scouts on it. And you pointed out the biggest issue is the truck roll, RMA, uh, replacement and stuff. So how does your software speed up the process or optimize it? Digitizing data is one thing, right? Guys use Salesforce today, right? Yeah. But how do you, where's the value add coming in your uh, yeah. business model? The, the value add uh, comes from uh, two different sources. One would be making the life of the sales tech uh, more effective when they're on site. In the end, if they are doing work for you or for any client, they're gonna have to collect data and send that data in the format of a report or something to your client, hey, we did this work. Uh, so streamlining kind of the workflow, uh, also gaining consistency among different uh, field technicians. So as you know, there are different levels. Um, not everyone executes the work. Uh, the, not everyone has the same background, so it's difficult to get that consistency. So with that, you want get consistency. Second, you optimize the process. And then on the back end, uh, all that data gets a structure and adds value to your client. There's no steam, uh, a lot of the aggregated data. It's like, oh, uh, do I, am I having more issues with these projects that are built by this CTC company? I need to talk to them. I need to figure out why we're having those issues. There's very actionable data that comes out of that work, which is right now really not a lot of company has to uh, have access to it, to that. All right, keep it as on time. Robert, Dina, Sadiq, thank you. Thank you.